we had uh, we called their original paper biophysical economics and the end of economic growth and I I really appreciate Robin's critical things about growth because I think we've got two processes that are going growth which is a flow and accumulation which is a change in stock and I think they're quite often confused and so I would like to start out by saying I'm teaching ecological economics this semester and I was um, I am oops uh oh I need to go back to where I need to go hmm There I go. So I'm teaching ecological economics this semester, and so I've been using Herman Daly's book, uh, Beyond Growth, and there is this marvelous quote in there he has. Um, oh, I see. See the problem. There's this marvelous quote he has in there where he's talking about John Stuart Mill. And so that was so Mill was talking, Daly was talking about John Stuart Mill and said that, you know, it's a shame his notions on the stationary state aren't known. And maybe their teachers knew it, but didn't feel it was worthy of transmission. So I got to thinking that the same thing about what is traditionally known as growth theory um, is much the same. Because in this day and age, growth theory starts with the work of Robert Solo <laughs> and ends with this kind of frictionless adjustment to a perfectly competitive system known as dynamic stochastic general equilibrium theory. And hardly anybody has ever read what Solo read before he wrote his paper. Um, that Solo's paper was largely a critique of the work of Roy Herod, and by implication the work of Absi Domar. And so I've taken it to, I took a quote from Robert Barrow, fairly well-known growth economist, that says, you know, that, okay, Herod and Domar attempted to integrate Keynesian economics, which wasn't about growth, with some growth theory, and they use production functions with little substitutability amongst inputs to argue that capitalism is unstable. Um, no and yes. They didn't use production functions with, any, with little substitutability about inputs, and they did argue that capitalism was unstable. And then the very end says, this has very little to do with, you know, this doesn't add anything to modern analysis. Um, my point is, um, I asked the question Paul Krugman asked, after thing, how did economists get it so wrong? Well, I think they got it wrong by emphasizing the elegance of general equilibrium models and not dealing with what's going on in the economy. And so those that, that Solo critiqued, in a couple papers in 1956 and 1957, actually have some insights into building an economic theory that has got something to do with the real world economy, rather than simply an elegant model. Um, ah, I see. So, I've looked through uh, selected headlines, right? and they're all about growth. I mean, these came from Marketplace, from the New York Times, I mean, from all over. Everything's about growth, like Bill Reese was saying in the Canadian elections, that it's not about building a sustainable, it's who's got the best growth plan. And this is much the same. 
in the United States. Um, and so here's the problem. If you look at, at overall growth, which I think reflects the increased throughput, which depletes resources faster and puts more carbon, it's been growing exponentially. But if you look at percentage growth upon which employment depends, it has been very volatile with a downward trend, which gives us a dual dilemma. We're growing too rapidly and too slowly at the same time. Our throughput is growing rapidly enough to have potentially serious catastrophic damage. At the same time, it's not growing fast enough to provide for employment. That's the dilemma. Um, and I think some of the older theorists started to address that. Um, <coughs> labor productivity often depends upon investment, which has also been tremendously volatile. And, you know, the questions of growth and accumulation form the questions of classical political economy. They all had a theory of accumulation. They all thought for various reasons it would end in a stationary state. There were various ideas. Mill thought it would be a fairly good thing. Smith thought it would be melancholy to tragic. Um, but everybody talked about accumulation. That changed with the marginal revolution. Um, and so Solo starts his 1956 paper just about modeling and says you have to make some assumptions. If you don't, it's not a model. But some assumptions, the results depend sensitively on them and they're crucial assumptions. And his greatest crucial assumption was that resources are substitutes. Um, he then went back and said Herod and Domar used well, Leontiev fixed in fixed proportion isoquants. But I've gone through and read all of Herod's and all of Domar's papers, and there's nothing there that says that. There is not a fixed proportion isoquant in any of their papers. As a matter of fact, Domar talks about many substitutions that can be made. Um, I, one could infer it from their all what are called multiplier accelerator models, and those depend upon a fixed proportion between capital spending and GDP. But no one ever makes the assumption that inputs aren't substitutable. Yet, Solo does go ahead and substitutes fully substitutable inputs, uh, Cobb Douglas production function with. Um, a elasticity of substitution is one, rendering everything an input, and presto, a dramatic social problem turns into a technical one that converges upon steady state growth. And don't confuse steady state growth, which means constant exponential growth, which Robert Gordon has estimated to be about 1.8 percent since the Civil War, with the steady state. They're, they're rather different things. Um, so he assumes, you know, not only is nature a, a homogeneous input, there's only one output, gross national product, um, there's a constant proportion of safe, and that wages keep up with productivity, which doesn't seem to have a whole lot um, of evidence in the empirical record that there's full employment, there's constant returns to stale, and the instability just disappears. Um, get a steady state growth path, and you know, you solve a simple differential equation, and the only thing that will limit is lack of capital, but if we have a steady supply of savings, then the economy can grow at a steady state growth path. Um, and then this is once again imposed as a condition for modernity to poor countries who are in many ways living at less than subsistence and so the plan is to just force higher savings and the next generation will simply be better off. Um, there's a couple problems. One is when they tried to measure it, the famous solo residual that only 
one of his first equations, capital and labor put together only explained about 12.5% of what was going on. 87% was a residual, which was a, assumed to be technical change. There's no definition of technology. There's no unit of measurement for it. It's just the unexplained residual. Um, the other problem was what I think is a fundamentally incorrect critique of both Herod and Domar. Um, they never used Leontia fixed proportion isoquants. Um, the focus was on Herod. He had nothing to say about Domar except by implications. And Domar in his 50, let's see, his 46 paper said, well, you know, as this paper went to publication, I stumbled upon this paper by Roy Herod. So they did not work together. They never collaborated. Um, and, but Solo says it is a conflict between a, what he calls a warranted growth rate and a natural growth rate. But if you've ever read the paper, has anybody ever read Herod's paper? Right, so it's a 22-page paper, and the natural growth rate appears only on page 17. What you've got is a conflict between an actual growth rate and a warranted growth rate. Uh, being Keynes' biographer and a contemporary, he came out of the same psychological school um, of trade cycles, and... Um, the warranted growth rate was psychological. It left investors feeling they hadn't invested too much or too little. And the actual growth rate is just the percentage change in output, which I've showed fluctuating. And therefore, it's a relation between the propensity to save and the number of capital goods to produce one unit of output, the accelerator, which he called the relation in his earlier book on the trade cycle. Um, so if the growth rate's faster than the warranted growth rate, the increase in capital goods per unit of output falls below the desired level, which leads to a depreciation of stock, which leads to a further divergence. And the gap is larger the greater the level of, of expansion. If the growth rate is less than the warrant growth rate, excess capacity develops and there's a decline in further incentive to this. It is your classic positive feedback loop, which... Herod himself called a centrifugal force field um, that I think Herod, though, in many ways can be interpreted as a, as a proto-biophysical economist, that biophysical limits really did get incorporated into the natural growth rate. And if the if the natural growth rate set by demographic forces, and I would also say biophysical forces, is less than the actual growth rate, it can only serve as a, as a mechanism to bring, the natural, to bring the actual growth rate down to the natural growth rate. Domar had some interesting takes that um, he said the problem was the dual nature of investment. It created income, but it also created productive capacity. And the boost by income was short-lived, but the excess capacity was long-lived, which would be a further drain on investment. So the system tends to tend towards stagnation. Um, that, and then finally, some homage to my academic grandfather, Alvin Hansen, said the problem is that you've got a multiplier and an accelerator working. To have a big boost from the multiplier, you want a high propensity to consume. To get a big boost from investment, you want a high propensity to save. Both can't happen at the same time, and so what you get is volatile fluctuations. Um, and so I'd like to end up by saying that this adds so much more because it talks about the conflict between the real economy, between the components of demand, and the biophysical capacities. And when you compare it to what's out there in the terms of you know, frictionless adjustments to a perfectly competitive system, I think it's worth going back and studying. Thank you. So I am not going to let anybody ask me questions. <laughs>
Um, instead, I am going to call Sabina O'Hara up and yield my seat.